Welcome everybody. On behalf of Chapter Zero and Fidelio, we're delighted to welcome you to Lessons from the Chair, a Decade of Climate Risk and Opportunity. And we're delighted to welcome Richard Gillingwater, who's the Chair of SSE. Um, we're particularly delighted as um, today is um, Richard's last day of office. Um, and I think this is one of uh, Richard's last engagements for, on behalf of SSE, um, and there couldn't be a more important topic. We'll also be joined later in the um, webinar by, uh, with Rachel McEwen, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer of SSE, and Julie Baddeley, who's the Chair of Chapter Zero. But first, to set the scene. And if we look at this chart, we can see that um, if we look at the role of the chair as defined by the FSC, uh, sorry, the FRC, the chair leads the board and is responsible for its overall effectiveness in directing the company. And surely there can't be a more important issue than climate change and um, mitigating climate change. And certainly we're seeing this um, absolutely rising up the board agenda. And if I look at, um, we've um, cited some examples um, from uh, recent conversations with chairs as part of assignments. On the search side, we certainly see um, chairs looking, do we have the skills in the boardroom? Do we have the understanding of climate change, the experience in addressing climate change, the willingness to learn? And, and here we think of chapter zero, but also at executive level, the committed CEO, the knowledgeable executive committee and a chief, and a chief sustainability officer. But equally, when we look through our board evaluations, we're seeing these questions being addressed. How is climate change being addressed through the board agenda? Is the board alert to opportunities as well as risks? Uh, the effectiveness of the board in monitoring progress towards net zero and committees. Uh, what is the role of the committees in addressing decarbonisation? So a number of themes very, very clearly on the board agenda. Um, and if we um, move to the next slide, please. Um, also for chapter zero, the role of the chair is critical. And I'd like to now hand over to um, uh, Julie, who sadly can't be with us in person, to share a few words on the importance of the chair in um, dealing with climate change and ensuring that climate change is on the board agenda. As the chair of chapter zero, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this discussion on the role of the chair in leading the climate debate in the boardroom. Um, it's a really important topic and one that we've been very aware of uh, as exercising our members over the time since we've been going with the network. Many of you on the call are Chapter Zero members, um, but for those who aren't, Chapter Zero is a free membership network for non-executive directors who want to become better informed on the climate challenge for their companies and how to tackle it. We have about 1,300 members and well over half the companies in the FTSE 100 have a board member in our network. We run events, develop guidance and toolkits, and share experience. So if you're a NED and you um, are not a member, do have a look at the website and join us. So just a little bit of history on how we came to be here today. Um, a group of us non-executive directors came together in 2018 to talk about board engagement in the climate challenge. And we rapidly identified that this was a task that needed the whole board on side, that non-execs generally weren't up to speed on the issue, so needed some support. Before we launched chapter zero in the summer of 2019, we found through our research that 85% 80, of boards had not yet had any conversation about the impacts of climate change on their business or the impacts of their business on the climate. Now in 2021, I doubt if anyone on this call hasn't had some debate in their boardroom on this important issue. We fully recognize that as with all organization transformation, this work needs to be led by the executive team. But we realized early on that once a company started to unpack the future using scenario planning under TCFD, for example, the conclusions are so far reaching often and significant that the non-execs needed to have a thorough understanding to fully debate the issues. The executives needed non-executive and chair support 
because otherwise they couldn't make the decisions that would be needed to tackle this really important challenge. And of course, the chair is key. The chair sets the agenda, make sure we have sufficient time, that strategic discussions cover the right topics, and that the board has appropriate papers and inputs to help the discussion. In short, they need to get this onto the agenda. I know that SSE was one of the first companies in the UK to take up this challenge. I first became aware of their work when I was the judge for the Finance for the Future Awards in 2019, in the days when we could all meet together and celebrate the work of our best companies over a glass of wine. I couldn't have been more pleased, therefore, when last year Richard agreed to become one of the supporting chairs for Chapter Zero. Richard knows as well as anyone what's involved in challenging the direction of travel of a large company, making the right investments, setting targets, delivering change on a massive scale, and the results are truly impressive. A lot of companies are still at a very early stage in this journey and are just starting out on the road to zero emissions. In the last year, many have set out a commitment to net zero in line with the UK government's target. However, those of us who've been in business for many years, some longer than we care to remember, know that setting the ambition is in many ways the easy part. Developing robust plans and even more delivering them on the ground is when the rubber hits the road. Tackling emissions and adapting to the physical risks of climate change affect the whole organization. Everybody needs to be engaged. Before I hand over to Richard to share his wisdom and experience from the chair, I would like to thank Fidelio for hosting this session with us and Gillian in particular for all the support she's given as a founder and steering group member of Chapter Zero. So I'll hand back to Gillian and I believe that you're about to vote on one of the issues. Well, thanks to Julie. Um, and now a little audience participation. Um, Julie touched upon uh, the, the role of the board, the role of the executive, but could we ask um, our um, participants who include, um, our audience includes chairs, non-executive directors and executive directors, who has the greatest influence on a company's credibility and effectiveness in addressing climate change? A, the chair, B, the board, or C, the CEO? And uh, Ben, if we could open that to uh, the poll, and if I could ask people to submit their answers. So interesting, perhaps a little bit more differentiated than one would have expected. 49% think it's the CEO, 36% the board, and 16% the chair. Um, so I guess if one um, adds the chair and the board, um, there's, there's quite an interesting conclusion there, but perhaps um, something for Richard to think about when he comes to, uh, to his session. Uh, thank you, I'll just close that. Um, and now moving on to um, SSE. I mean, we're delighted to welcome SSE and I'm not going to spend, dwell on these charts because Richard will be um, speaking shortly, uh, but SSE has set a net zero commitment um, and four fundamental goals for 2030. Um, with an interesting combination of the fourth of those um, uh, on, on um, looking at the justice, I guess, of, of, of climate change as well, um, and has also committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050 at the latest, um, which was um, published uh, last November. And then for the eagle-eyed among you, yesterday um, there was a press release from um, SSE. If we could look to the next chart, please. Uh, where SSE seeks shareholder approval for climate action plan. And I think this may also be a topic that comes up um, as we see more and more um, uh, companies beginning to seek shareholder approval for their climate action plans or being requested by shareholders to do so. And next chart, please. And I'm delighted to welcome Richard. As mentioned, today is um, Richard's last day as um, chair of um, SSE. And um, Richard has been um, on the board of SSE since 2007 and became chair in 2015. Um, he's also um, chair of the Janice Henderson Group, um, senior independent director of Whitbread uh, and a governor of the Wellcome 
trust. And um, I know Richard spoke to chapter zero in 2019. And I think many of those pointers are very, very relevant about not just what the company can do, but what the board can be doing to support the company in that journey towards net zero. We're also joined on the call, uh, next chart please, by um, the Chief Sustainability Officer of um, uh, SSE, who was quoted for the eagle-eyed among you on, on the previous chart. Um, and um, Rachel um, will also just support us if, on, 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 um, if questions arise. Um, and if we could move to the next chart. We've structured this webinar really where well, we're going to ask three very open questions um, of Richard. And I should ask um, audience members, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A function and we will have some time at the end um, to answer them. So Richard, welcome. And really, if we could kick off, during your time as chair, can you walk us through SSE's climate journey? Yes. Uh, first of all, let me just start with a thank you to um, Julie and to Gillian <coughs> for inviting me to speak today. And I'm also very pleased to have Rachel McEwen, our Chief Sustainability Officer, also with us. Um, and to put this story in context, I joined the board of SSE back in 2007 um, and became chair in 2015. And it's really from the vantage point of uh, being chair that I'll give my reflections. But I've been on the uh, journey, the low carbon journey. Uh, really every step of the way. And I think the, that story coincidentally starts uh, with when I joined the board. I can't say I was instrumental at that point, but um, played my part as a board member then. Uh, the key thing was that the UK was um, creating what would become at the time world leading legislation to cut carbon by 80% um, compared to 1990. And it was that law combined with the European Renewable Energy Directive um, and reforms to the energy market uh, that really laid the path that would lead uh, particularly to the end of coal fired generation in less than 20 years in the UK and would also stimulate one of the fastest growing renewable energy markets in the world. And so back in 2007, eight, uh, just to give you a, a picture, SSE's electricity generation at the time was probably the most balanced in the sector. It was about a third coal, a third gas, and a third renewables. And what this meant in, in broad terms was that, was that SSE's scope one, or direct emissions, were around 25 million tonnes of CO2. And at, at that time, that made us one of the largest carbon polluters in in the country, not a position we were particularly proud of. The board and management team worked together um, and we did a lot of work at the time with uh, a great cross section of, of people uh, who were beginning to worry about the very specific impacts of, um, of coal in particular. And we worked with climate activists to support uh, a tough, carbon target that we adopted. It started as a 60% cut. And the other key point about it was that it, it, it had to be done as it were on our patch by domestic effort. We couldn't export uh, the um, carbon. So for SSE, the carbon targets meant it must progressively reduce emissions from coal fired power generation. And we brought the last of our coal-fired generation to an end in March 2020, uh, well ahead of um, the government's target. So I think that was that was a very key um, thing that came out of um, something that had started much earlier. At the other end of the scale, um, a very key moment for the company uh, was, uh, in essence, in the first few days of 2008, um, and that involved the acquisition of a very dynamic renewables developer uh, based in Ireland called Electricity. Um, and in essence, while our heritage 
or while Scottish Hydro's heritage had been in the hydroelectric revolution in the 50s, um, our attempt to, to build out a wind portfolio had been less than successful. So we were looking at ourselves in 2007, 2008, basically not very happy with our, uh, our generating mix in particular and our position in renewables. The electricity acquisition at the time was um, it cost us a, uh, just on 1 billion euros. And so we were placing a very significant bet at that time, um, just months as it happened before the whole um, financial crash. And with the costs of building out the pipeline that Airtricity had, uh, it turned out we were undertaking a very, very significant risk uh, just at the moment of peak financial markets volatility. It, it actually meant um, that we had to go into the equity markets for the first and only time that SSE has visited them to do an equity issue in, in essence to finance that uh, that deal. And I have to say, putting all of that together, that was a pretty choppy moment for SSE because we were regarded at the time as um, had potentially having overpaid for electricity. Alongside that, uh, that, that uh, acquisition, that pivotal acquisition, um, and really working quietly in the background uh, throughout all of this period was uh, in effect, the, the effect of the renewables re revolution on our transmission business in Scotland. And its job uh, increasingly became, uh, in effect, to transmit the power from the renewables rich north uh, to the population centres of the south. And as a consequence, again, over that period of 2008 to the present day, uh, that business has grown some tenfold. That gives you a sense of the scale of renewables, not just in uh, SSE's stable, but across the waterfront in Scotland. Now, despite all this uh, clear progress being made in de decarbonizing SSE's activities, we had another big think about where we were in 2018, 19, and we decided to re-articulate our corporate purpose vision uh, and strategy alongside a, a comprehensive review of our operating model. And we, we did this uh, partly to have a more single-minded focus on our low carbon core, but also we were thinking deeply about the fit of our retail energy supply business and whether it was good in our hands or whether it should be um, given to a more focused um, retail player and in the end decided that um, it was better in another player's hands, it turned out over. Uh, and this enabled us to really focus down on our low, on our, what we call our low carbon core. Um, another factor regarding the re-articulation of our purpose was that we were very much inspired by um, work that the Future of the Corporation project was doing, led by Colin Mayer, Professor Colin Mayer. Um, and in particular, I, I want to give um, him and that initiative, uh, led ultimately by the British Academy, uh, certainly quite a lot of credit for the debate it provoked inside SSE, but I think actually more widely um, about the importance of purpose backed up by the principles that that um, working group has enunciated. And I'm, I'm pleased to say, just as a, a, a further point on that, that SSE were one of the very first backers of that whole project. Um, we felt, I have to say, we felt quite lonely in the first stages of that project. There were an awful lot of um, academics and NGOs interested. Um, sadly, very few corporates. There are now a lot of corporates that are involved, which is good. Uh, and the ethos that comes from that project is, is basically to articulate the purpose of business so as to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and the planet. And I think that this, this has provided a perfect mantra for SSE, which uh, 
way back in 2008, very much pinned its colors to the decarbonization mast. So in addition to re-articulating our, our vision and as it were, making our strategy even more focused, we, the other important thing we did uh, was we had a, a very large operating model review energetically led by a CEO and, and obviously fully supported by the board. And what this did was to re essentially reorganize the whole of SSE into much more devolved, uh, stronger, more autonomous businesses. And those principally are SSE renewables, SSE transmission and SSE distribution. And, and they are now um, very much the core uh, of our business and all are hungry for growth. And I think this operating model that set us up for, as it were, the next phase of decarbonization, uh, where the markets are getting uh, a lot more competitive. And I, you know, we've seen that recently with the um, enormous prices that are being paid for seabed uh, development rights um, led by the Crown Estates. That the operating model work was also uh, done alongside some further tough decisions, which were in part uh, uh, driven by our climate change targets. Uh, and they were in effect to um, divest our gas production and our waste to energy businesses. So I think if I put all that together in terms of the journey, then and I'm just being selective here, but um, some of the results I think are quite encouraging. So right now, SSE are constructing more offshore wind generation capacity than any other company in the world. Um, the proportion of renewable energy on our transmission network is now around 90% uh, with multi-billion uh, investment plans uh, in place for the years ahead. And then finally, uh, and this is uh, an important one that we want to be judged by, SSE's carbon emissions have fallen by over two thirds from their peak, and they're now around 8 million tons uh, as of April 2020. And, and this does mean that we're on, we are on target to meet our science-based carbon target. Um, and we hope we're going to do this much quicker, but certainly on target to be net zero by 2050 at the latest. So that's a sort of um, reflection on on the journey, Gillian. Thank you. And um, you've taken us through um, a number of strands, the, the structure of the business, the, 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 the re-emphasizing of, of, of the portfolio, also the internal, um, the focus on purpose and, and um, uh, a number of issues there and, and, and a number of achievements. But I think often one also learns from the challenges. And um, perhaps if we can move to the next question that I've said, um, against you know, that, that, that backdrop, what were the key challenges? Were they internal? Were they external, market-based? How would you summarize the challenges? Um, well, I, 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 um, I'm sure lots of people have got different views in SSE, but I've, I've tried to boil them down in my mind to three. There are probably many more, but, but certainly three. I think the first is very much an external challenge. Um, and that was what horse should we back in our desire to decarbonize? Uh, should it be nuclear? Should it be offshore wind uh, or even carbon capture? Um, and so if I, if I take you back in the UK, uh, well, in the UK now, uh, the electricity sector is responsible for about 75% of carbon reductions in the whole economy um, as per the last carbon budget that the government produced. Um, and so I think it's true that the electricity sector is, is really the first big sector to have made significant progress to decarbonize. And I think it's, um, it's, it's well understood that it's many, many years ahead of things like road transport um, and also uh, heat and aviation and shipping. 
but if I if I take myself back uh, to where we were as a board, and I go back ten years, it certainly wasn't very clear what path electricity would take at that time. There were very some very tricky judgments about technology, and so in in two thousand and thirteen, for instance, it it seemed like nuclear might be the uh, important show in town, uh, or even uh, the government's then sponsorship of a very big uh, carbon capture and storage project. And at that time, it, it definitely seemed like offshore wind was an also ran. And so, in fact, um, at that time and for a brief moment, we we stepped back from offshore wind. We had got um, some in our portfolio, but we decided we were going to pause. Uh, because the risks um, didn't seem to uh, warrant the amount of investment that, that would have been required. And in our case, um, we threw ourselves into a project. We did this in a joint venture with Shell, uh, which was to create the first major uh, carbon capture and storage scheme up in Scotland at Peterhead around our gas generation plant there. Um, and this was all ready to go, um, literally, until uh, the night before the announcement was going to be made, the Treasury, in effect, blocked the investment. Um, and that was the end of dem the demonstrator. Uh, history will record that that money, about a billion pounds, uh, went to top up the police pension fund. You can make your own judgment about the um, priorities there. Um, we, during this period, we dipped our toe into uh, the nuclear water, so to speak. And we again, in joint, joint venture, explored that and very quickly again realized that the financial risks were beyond our capability. And I guess in the meantime, and this will come to a, a theme um, I'll talk about towards the end, uh, we very much kept at building our onshore wind um, and, and making that uh, very successful, but keeping enough skin in the game in the offshore wind uh, area so that when economic conditions allowed, we could um, turn around and capitalize on that. So I think you know one of the points uh, about all of this is that if you're viewing it from the board's point of view, um, there was no clear one way through all of this. And in fact, where we find ourselves now in terms of offshore wind development certainly wasn't a given um, until probably 2015, the earliest. So technology, uh, which markets to go into is certainly one of the challenges. And another, another challenge um, has been the whole political and regulatory environment, which we've had to navigate um, the energy industry at various moments has been vilified um, and, you know, that in itself has been very difficult. Um, it led to um, post the financial crash uh, and the period of austerity after that, it led to, um, in, in essence, uh, ultimately the price cap regime that uh, Theresa May brought in. And indeed, to um, the Corbyn-led Labour Party with uh, one of their leading um, uh, mandates being to effectively renationalize various utilities, including the energy utilities. I think the way we've, we've tried to navigate that um, has, has been always to have in mind that we particularly serve the public interest and that our mission is very much uh, providing energy safely, reliably and affordably so that we can actually earn the right to make a profit. Um, and it, it's also meant, and this is why you see um, one of our last goals is around living wages and fair tax. It's also meant actually uh, having a very, very big focus on the importance of paying tax. We're still 
one of a very few companies that actually submit themselves to fair tax mark accreditation. Um, and it, it's partly part of the reason for that is that a lot of companies actually, when they look at it, realize how convoluted their tax affairs are and how difficult it is to meet the standards of that. But we've, we've been pursuing that now for a long time. Um, and I, you know, I think um, that that uh, has come together as, as it happens um, in having a good ESG policies and practice. And in the period since 2018, we've deliberately uh, placed the creation of value uh, for both shareholders and society at the center of our stated objectives. Uh, and you started with our, our big goals, but we also decided that we would challenge ourselves in four very big areas and basically align those four goals to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and use all the tools that we had, but particularly remuneration framework, in effect to entrench uh, those values um, and those goals in, in our whole drive. And so rather than mitigating political risk, what, what we've actually found is that, that by having the approach that we've had, um, it not only has helped us mitigate political risk, but it's actually enhanced our ESG credentials and ratings. So I think that that's been um, an important challenge, which I, I hope we've turned into something of an opportunity. And then the one where I think um, the board has maybe been instrumental is in creating a systematic approach to thinking about the impact of climate change. And here, um, I can understand that a company starting now on its low carbon journey is faced with a whole array of different frameworks. So there are different ESG international standards, and there's obviously now uh, in climate terms, the TCFD. There are various rating providers out there um, all vying uh, to get share of mind. There are green indices and green ETFs. But a decade ago, uh, there was very little. Um, we didn't have that complexity to navigate. Um, and in a way, our, our focus was initially simply on report, the reporting framework created by the CDP. And apart from our greenhouse gas emission reporting requirements, the UK, our involvement in everything that's followed has been voluntary. But I think we realized uh, seven, to, seven or eight years ago, just the importance of having our own frameworks to judge ourselves by. Um, we were helped uh, in that, as I've said, initially um, by political and regulatory stakeholders and then um, hugely recently, obviously, by investors. And through the process of, of that evolution that I've talked about and all the board oversight that's gone into that, um, one of the absolutely core cool things that, that came out of um, wanting to have a really challenging approach was to create the role of chief sustainability officer, in our case, reporting direct to the CEO and to the board. And, and uh, in a way, I, I, I wanted Rachel here partly to acknowledge the sheer importance of that role and the way in which if you give it to the right person and empower them, um, and they have uh, a, a very senior influence within the company, then that role can really underpin what you're trying to achieve. And as I've said, in early 2019, when we'd finalized our um, company purpose uh, and strategy, uh, we made this shift uh, in our narrative to creating value, not only for our shareholders, but for society and aligning our four big goals to the UN Sustainability Goals. And here, what, one of the things that we did, and again, I think this was 
um, innovative at the time was uh, in effect to link executive remuneration to those goals. Uh, in a way, it was the final step, and it's still this is still very much unfinished business. Um, but it was a way of you know really signalling to the executive the importance of our our various intents, but also to uh, give a strong signal to our stakeholders and shareholders that we were deadly serious about it. Um, and with a plethora of frameworks to choose from, I think that the final thing to say on this is that the creation of our own guiding star is, is are those four big goals linked to the SDGs. And I, you know, I think the, the thing that we constantly ask ourselves is, you know, how, how do those drive, how do they fit in, how do they drive what we're trying to achieve? And in particular, what we're keen to avoid is any suggestion of uh, what I call purpose washing or green washing. So those are the sort of three challenges I've identified. Um, I'm sure, as I say, there are plenty more. Thank you. No, those are very clearly structured as well. And, and um, I can see questions coming in. And if I could just say at this point, please, if you do have questions, send them to the Q&A um, function and we'll um, seek to um, answer them at, at, at the end, towards the end of the webinar. Um, and my third question um, for Richard, um, really as a chair, what would be your key recommendations for any chair really keen to prepare the company for climate change? Yeah, so I, again, I've, um, I've limited this to three. Um, I, th I see these three very strongly in SSE. Uh, so I think the first one, and maybe the obvious one, uh, I'll call people and culture. Um, uh, and I think, uh, let me start by saying culture uh, is hugely critical in companies, um, was very important in SSE and is very important. I think SSE had in many ways the benefit of being very rooted in its local communities. Um, and partly as a result of that, always had quite a strong practical uh, dialogue with its stakeholders. Um, and this provided the impetus for those early discussions about decarbonization. If you think about the Scottish Hydro Revolution in the 50s and you know the way in which that required a lot of stakeholder community support. And then what we were doing even before 2008 in terms of building um, onshore wind farms, they required a very symbiotic relationship with the uh, local community. And, and what we found largely uh, in those Scottish communities is, is that that whole climate change imperative has a very strong support. Um, so that, that's been very important, um, but also obviously critically uh, leadership is important. And I was quite struck by the poll uh, that put a big emphasis on the CEO. I actually put the CEO as my uh, option. I, I think, um, leadership is is really crucial and again in SSE's case we've been very lucky to have two things uh, first of all a very stable management team so we're only on to our second CEO since 2001 and we're still on our first CFO since 2001 I think that's probably one of the most stable teams in the FTSE 100 um, but more importantly um, this has always been a team that has believed strongly in the importance of taking action to mitigate climate change. And I, uh, you know, when we had to create, as it were, our own guiding star in this, which happened to be a carbon reduction target, uh, it, that whole initiative was very much led by the leadership. Um, and obviously hugely supported by the board. But it, 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 if it hadn't come from the leadership, I doubt it would have resonated anywhere near as much. So lead people, culture and leadership, very important. Something I touched on earlier in our case is the importance of optionality. 
and maybe things are becoming clearer now, but uh, when I was describing the pathway uh, to electricity decarbonisation, um, you know, I, I talked about the various options that we had um, and, and indeed the various possible paths we might have taken. And I think it's fair to say that, that SSE has always been good at building options in different, in different areas. So for instance, although we now have a focus on offshore, uh, we are uh, one of the, I hope, key drivers behind the carbon capture, the current carbon capture initiatives that are ongoing. Um, and we're very keen to be at the heart of making those work because fundamentally for our system, we need flexible generation. So we need, um, we need optionality. At the same time, you can't hang on to too many options, otherwise you dissipate effort and resource. So there's a, a balance to be struck. And then the, the, the final one, um, the final bit of advice is obviously um, strategy um, and building in uh, it, as it were, a strong sense of uh, your climate change action plans into that strategy. And I think it's fair to say from SSE's point of view, um, it strategy is a constant process. So you know, while, whilst we have the typical annual review, uh, we also regularly undertake soundings with stakeholders um, and we go out of our way actually to seek contrarian views. Um, and then actually sometimes if they're very interesting contrarian views, we'll, we'll get them into the board um, over a dinner or uh, actually into a set piece in the board. Um, so it, there's a sense in which um, strategy is uh, always a constant iteration rather than a single event. And really looking back over the past three years, I, I think SSE's shape has changed enormously. I, I hope now that what we have is a very focused strategy and purpose with net zero and net zero imperative hardwired um, into our statements of intent. Um, our strategy will obviously inevitably continue to evolve, but I think at the moment I feel, and you know, this, these are probably my closing words, is, um, as chair that we, we are now in a good position as a company. We're one of the leading uh, green energy companies. And, and I think we, I hope we have very solid growth prospects. Thank so you. That's, that's more than enough from me. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that, that's, um, that's great. And we're, we're getting a lot of questions um, in, but before we move to the floor, can I just ask um, your views on, um, board composition and climate change, how you think about the skills that you need at board level and any views on committees and how the committees support the work of the board in, in, in this regard? Yes, well, just, so on committees, we have a, um, we have a uh, health uh, and safety committee that is also very focused on sustainability and and on um, climate change. Um, and I think that does very important work, um, but particularly backed up by Rachel as Chief Sustainability Officer. Um, and I think I, I, I really don't want to um, understate the importance of having someone like a Rachel to challenge and make things happen, but supported by uh, that that committee uh, which is chaired by one of our our board members i think on the question of um specialization then i i think um we don't have any uh climate change specialists um i think we found the wherewithal to um as it were respond to the executive's challenge here from within um, our resources. Um, one of the things I think that has happened is we've all become very educated in this. And again, that's partly because of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the role that, that Rachel and her team have played in educating us um, and in getting us involved. And 
making decision making make you know make having the right um, components in that regarding uh, the impacts of that on climate change uh, but i don't i don't think you need to have particular specialization that it helps if someone's come from a particular uh, journey and their company has been demonstrably successful but i don't i don't think beyond that it requires particular uh, skills other than you know a simple acceptance and desire to make make a difference and in the meantime more and more companies getting more and more exposure so there is a there's yes. a learning curve that's going yes yeah, so now you know i i in that respect i could completely endorse chapter zero its approach um, the way in which you know it's it's quietly built up this um very large group now of of um, very interested members and not just in the UK, internationally as well. And, and not, not just in the UK, but internationally, yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm going to turn to questions from um, the floor. Um, we have a question. With hindsight, Richard, is there anything you would have done differently or at a different pace? I, well, I think I, hindsight's, um, hindsight's always a wonderful thing. I think if we'd had perfect hindsight, um, we would not have gone down those other tracks of nuclear. We didn't go down nuclear heavily, but we went down it to a certain extent. We certainly put a lot of effort into the carbon capture initiative and, and frankly wasted a huge amount of endeavor there. Um, I think we might have taken a braver stance on offshore wind earlier, um, but at the time, I remember it, just seeming so um, uh, so relatively unfavoured by government and um, so expensive. And can I ask a question about, um, you, you talked a lot about stakeholders, um, and clearly critical to the, the, the board's thinking process and to the success of, 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 of many initiatives. What's the role of the board in that stakeholder engagement? Obviously there are different types of stakeholders, but um, what, what role, for example, did you play as chair or does the board play in, in some of the stakeholder initiatives um, that, that you mentioned? Um, quite a wide role. And this has evolved again, um, all, for the, all for the good. Um, but we'd always um, had a practice of uh, getting some of our stakeholders um, to meet the board. Um, and that, that started well before I became chair and it's something I very much um, continued. So, you know, we would meet with government, we would meet with um, regulators, we would meet with uh, shareholders, um, we would meet with customers. Um, I convened as chair, I, I convened an annual um, customer forum, which uh, was hard work because basically it was sort of an evening of... Um, serial complaints um, but it was important to to hear that as it were face to face and get you know get messages very directly um, so i think this this did get hardwired into our approach and at a board level so we were hearing it direct we've we've uh, now expanded it we're, we're like many other companies in this area i think the the whole um uh, focus around getting employee, stronger employee engagement, particularly with the board, has been an excellent initiative. And we have one of our uh, senior non-execs, Dame Sue Bruce, effectively has that engagement for us. And that, that has actually um, paid huge dividends. So she has a lot of contact, for instance, with our unions and just helps to explain to them you know, what the wider strategy is and, and how it all fits together. So I think I think um, I do talk a lot about it, and we have tried to explain where we think we are in terms of our engagement in our report and accounts, um, and that that partly is because I regard it as important, but also very much is very much a feature of um, what the company is and where it's come from. Thank you. 
And um, I do want to make sure, because I can see we're, we're gradually closing to, to, towards the end of the hour, um, that we have a little bit of time to talk about yesterday's press release. Can you talk us through the mechanism of, um, and, and the thinking behind the, um, uh, the, the seeking shareholder approval for the climate action plan? Um, there aren't many, many companies that have yet done that or announced that they're about to do it. So perhaps you could share with us a little bit of, yeah, I, and I might get uh, Rachel to say something about this, but I, I see this as part of um, the company, um, and this again is part of the sort of DNA of the company, that it, it's challenged itself in some uncomfortable areas. So, you know, I can remember the board meeting where we set the 60% um, reduction in, in carbon target and the debate around that. Um, and I think we've we've always, um, as it were, wanted to head into areas that, that challenged us and, and be as front-footed as we could be about those. Um, and we so you know, for instance, we've we've been a reasonably early adopter of TCFD. Um, we deliberately submitted our um, climate change plans and all our scenarios to the science-based initiative targets initiative uh, which was a which was a difficult process um, and i think this is the next in the line as it were of challenging ourselves to hold ourselves to account uh, and i i should say it stirred up quite a lot of board debate as well so it's um it wasn't entirely st straightforward that we would go down this route but we have um, decided to do that um, rachel do you want do you want to say something about the um, uh, intent of this. Yes, um, just to say thanks very much for giving me a tuppence worth. Um, I think, so the source of why we've done this is actually from the very constructive relationship we have with um, the Climate Action 100 plus group of investors. And for actually many years now, we've been engaging with what are the IIGCC, so the Institutional Investors Group in Climate Change, where they would heroically turn up at our annual general meeting each year in Perth, uh, armed with probably the best informed, best questions question which Richard would ask answer diligently and that relationship has meant that we've worked quite closely with them on an iterative basis around some of our disclosures on climate change and and they had approached us about the potential for a management sponsored resolution and it's true it's not it's not an easy thing to do and this actually marks a bit of reform really um, but of course for the company where our, our purpose and strategy is completely hardwired to the net zero transition. Um, on balance, we thought that actually this is in, in sort of everybody's best interests if we encourage greater shareholder engagement and involvement around our plans, but also in terms of an annual vote to confirm our, our net zero transition report. So it's not easy, but actually it's probably the, the direction of travel for greater engagement with our, our shareholders in the long run. Thank you. And, and I think you're among a handful of companies that are doing this voluntarily and, and um, uh, uh, being on the front foot, I think, is, is as, as Richard described it. Uh, thank you. Um, we've had a question just about um, culture. And um, Richard, did, did you meet any resistance? I mean, you talked quite a lot about the importance of purpose and culture and the work that had gone on internally. Uh, did you meet resistance within the organisation? And, um, and if so, how, how is the board, how is the company, did you respond to that? Well, I don't think we've ever met resistance. Um, in that sense. Um, what I do want to say, and again, I want to um, acknowledge Rachel's work here, um, but plainly some of our decisions have had quite big impacts. So I, I do think uh, of the hundreds of people that worked in our various coal-fired power stations, uh, many of which have been powering the country for 40 and 50 years. Um, and obviously, closing those down, um, and particularly given their extremely loyal workforce, was no easy thing um, at all. Um, I think there was, you know, to be fair to the individuals, there was a sense in their minds of the inevitability of this. 
um, it didn't make it easy. Um, and what it did do was focus our minds on the importance of what we call just transition. Um, and so we've, we've also, and this again has been very much um, pursued by Rachel, but we, we now have some principles regarding uh, the a just transition that we apply to a lot of our, well, to all of our development. So we sort of ask ourselves a series of questions um, and try to live by the principles of that, of, of those just transition principles. Rachel, I don't know whether there's anything you want to say about that. We lost Rachel. Yes, there yeah. we go. Sorry. Well, I could, yes, I could probably talk for Scotland on this one, but but I, I mean the whole point here is that again, if our strategy is to bring about um, the investments and uh, operations that bring about net zero, then you have to think quite deeply about the things that might get in the way of, of achieving that and if you look at the industrial transformations of the past we're not exactly covered in glory in terms of their impact on workers and communities and you can see how that may get in the way of our investments in the future so when you think of a just transition it is about fairness in its widest sense it's for consumers workers and communities and we're only an agent of influence we, we can't fix this but we can certainly have an influence and that's what we've we've thought through is how we can be part of the solution to ensure that as the whole economy transitions to net zero that there is fairness baked in for for everybody thank you i am very conscious of the time and um and so i am going to uh, gradually draw the webinar um to a close we do have a few questions that we haven't been able to answer and so i'll um, perhaps link up with rachel afterwards and see if we can um specifically go back to uh, the, the the questions that have come in um, but if we could perhaps just go to the next chart, please, Ben, and uh, as we draw to a close. Um, and we've just um, really summed up, um, and I think what Richard's done is really provided sort of meat on the bone to these more general points that, you know, from the get-go, it's very clear that the chair has a fundamental role to play in uh, ensuring the company is contributing to decarbonisation. Um, it's providing the board oversight challenge guidance and direction it's ensuring the board has the understanding and experience that's needed and at executive and indeed Richard probably spent as much time talking about the executive level as much as the board level in, in this regard um, and then the stakeholder engagement and in fact we just ended up very much on that note of, of, of stakeholder engagement um, and very clearly I think it was only 16% thought that the chair was the most influential a figure but it's the chair is a pretty important figure in this uh, in, in in this whole debate and certainly if you look at how the governance hangs together I think um, Richard's really demonstrated to us that that um, uh, that that forward thinking that ability to think through some very complex situations the strategic the, op the optionality really struck me as, as being one of the themes but also the purpose the culture um, and the building relationships internally and, and externally. Um, I'd like to thank Richard really very much for spending this time. We've had well over 100 participants on the, um, the webinar, and I, I think we'll also sum up some of the key takeaways and share them because I think there's a, a, a very clear sort of pathway um, there. So many, many thanks, Richard. Um, and also, um, every success going forward, and we do appreciate you. spending virtually your last hour in, <laughs> <laughs> with SSE, uh, with, with, with the current audience. Yeah. Um, and thank you also to everybody who's participated, to Rachel and to Julie for the contribution. Um, we will be cir circulating the charts with the links for the SSE material, um, and you'll have those tomorrow. And if anybody's interested in the um, recording, we'll make that available as well. And we will continue to keep you invited to um, future um, Chapter Zero and Fidelio events that we host on this subject. Thank you all very much. And particularly, thank you to Richard. Thank, thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.